computer. Okay, we're on record. So welcome everyone. Uh, we're really, really excited to have you. This is a topic I'm in incredibly interested in. And to join me today um, are a number of doctors who are amazing. And uh, that is, uh, we'll just start up there in the corner. So Dr. Matthew uh, Frazik Sizek, who also has a master's in nutrition, say hello. Hello everyone. And Dr. Eric Callahan, who teaches uh, biochem and nutrition at uh, Campbellsville in Kentucky. Yep, in and the then, South in Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And then Dr. <laughs> Kanita Shuvar Nasudi. Did I get it right? <laughs> there we go. Uh, Dr. Kanita, uh, who uh, is a chiropractor and an acupuncturist and uh, was my biochem tutor. I went to mm -hmm. school as well. <laughs> Erica was my fellow in nutrition. So I've been really blessed to have them. So we're going to divide up the presentation uh, between us all. And uh, and we really are super, super excited to do this. So um, without further ado, we will uh, get started. So I think I'll just do this and then this should work. And so um, we're calling this myth versus evidence because there is some myths out there on Instagram and TikTok and what people say or whatever they're doing. <laughs> and so we're really gonna just talk about real biochem and the literature and anybody who has a question, either chat in or just buzz in and mm -hmm. we'll be stopping and doing that. So uh, you can see that we have a lot of uh, knowledge between us. And so we're doing this. So Dr. Kenita. Yes. You know, so I'd like to say thank you, uh, Dr. B, for organizing this and making this presentation. Sorry, I'm getting over a cold, so I sound like this. But um, also, thank you for making me review my biochem again. So that was really fun to do. But yeah, this is just an overview of the importance of what we're going to go over today with the one carbon metabolism, how much of our body uses the methylation cycle, including... Um, the creatine production for skeletal muscle contraction, DNA and RNA synthesis, which is really good to, you know, make new cells for our body, the skin, hair, and nails, gene regulation, hormone regulation, detoxification, energy production, cell membrane repair, fat metabolism, myelination, which is the, uh, the part of the nerves that helps conduct, you know, all the pathways down, immune function, neurotransmitter production and metabolism, which is always really important for hormones and um, all that in our gut system as well. And the vascular endothelial function, which is a fancier way of saying, I would say like blood vessel and uh, the red blood cell production. So yeah, this is just a, like a general overview of how important the methylation cycle is. And um, we're going to go into talking about the gene MTHFR and um, all that fun stuff. So this is just a general overview of what we're going to talk about. Erica. All right. So one carbon metabolism. If you're like me a little while ago, I was like, I don't even know what that term means. What does one carbon metabolism mean? And it basically is just the passing kind of the juggling of your methyl group. So when we talk about methylation pathways, and everything we learned from Dr. Valiette and all of our other studies, that's what we're talking about. And like Kenita said, it's central to pretty much everything that we do intracellularly and tissue connection and everything like that, hormone synthesis, everything. So where we're going to focus is looking between um, our main methyl donator, which is S adenosylmethionine, which is SAMe. And what happens when we donate that methyl group off of SAMe, then we get homocysteine. So um, this is the little depiction, cartoon depiction of methionine. So here's our methionine. It picks up a methyl group. And methionine, if you remember, is part of the two sulfur-containing amino acids. We have methionine and we have cysteine. So very uh, high in those sulfur smelling foods, eggs and cruciferous vegetables and onions and garlic and all that good stuff that we know to be therapeutic, right? Um, when it picks up its methyl group, it's SAMe. Now SAMe is then gonna be our main methyl donor that's gonna drop that small methyl group to different chemical reactions. 
But the bummer thing that happens is when SAMe donates, it becomes homocysteine. And we don't like homocysteine. There are some consequences. So um, probably if you remember from your studies uh, in DC school and perhaps the master's, um, that homocysteine is correlated to cardiovascular risk. So here's a, a little synopsis of some of the studies that have been demonstrated since you know, the late 1960s, that the higher your homocysteine levels are, the more elevated your cardiovascular risk is. Um, so what we want to be able to do, which we'll see um, very soon in a lot of the slides, is we have to complete that cycle. So homocysteine has to be recycled back up to methionine so that we can continue to methylate, we can continue to donate our methyl group, and we don't want to get stuck in that homocysteine kind of like wheelhouse down here. So there's a couple of different players in that. There's B9 and B12, which I kind of, you know, think we classically think of as being a part of our methylation wheels. But we, um, I think we're forgetting sometimes about choline and lecithin. So we're going to talk about that a little bit too. So um, circulating levels of homocysteine can be because we're not metabolizing methionine, right? That could be because of those B vitamin deficiencies. Um, one that I didn't mention was B6. So B6 can also be part of that pathway. If we're low in B6, B9, B12, we might have elevated homocysteine levels. Um, another thing that's going to increase our homocysteine levels is um, not having enough choline or betaine, which we'll talk about in a second. And we found too that choline or betaine supplementation actually drops homocysteine levels. So it's all part of us just kind of getting that reactive, nasty intermediate back out of our pathway back to methionine. So the most important ones that we're focusing on tonight where SAMe drops its methyl group is muscle energy with creatine. We can't make that and we can't utilize that muscle energy component without SAMe. So we need methylation for that. We need, remember our car that drives the long chain fatty acids across into the mitochondria, our carnitine. We need that, right? We need methylation to create trimethylysine or carnitine in order for us to maintain good sympathetic nervous system response with our norepinephrine, epinephrine, fight or flight. We need methylation. And then we need methylation for the production of our choline too. And on the bottom here, you can see it's actually derived from one of our other amino acids, serine. We decarboxylate it, right? We pop off a CO2 and then we get this intermediate ethanol amine. And then here comes SAMe. We transfer that methyl group on and we make choline. And choline, you know, as stated here is needed for our acetylcholine, but it's, it's so much bigger than that too. It's part of our lipoproteins. It's part of our membrane lipids. Um, and it's the production of our neurotransmitter acetylcholine. So that's the autonomic nervous system as well. Right. And that's everywhere, neuromuscular junction and everything like that. Now choline is going to be oxidized to betaine. So choline and betaine are kind of you know, um, the same or can be. And then our main source of how we're going to get choline is lecithin. So lecithin, choline, nuts, eggs, cheese, chocolate, uh, chickpeas, stuff like that, and actually soy or sunflower lecithin. And that's the source that's found in potential power is sunflower lecithin. So it's going to be very good for our nervous system. And everybody who needs that really good fluid cellular membrane. So we need quite a bit. I mean, kids, especially and pregnant women uh, need a good amount because pregnant women are developing all these small little like, you know, nerve cells and little brains and little eyes and all these little organs that need all of those good cellular membrane support. So at least 500 to five, you know, 600 milligrams of choline per day for pregnant women, if not just for adults in general. If we're not getting that, you can imagine we might have muscle weakness, we might feel low energy and fatigue, we might be achy, uh, you might notice mood changes and things like that. Um, and we can supplement with choline and betaine, or we can eat it naturally, like in chocolate or you know some of the additives like our sunflower lecithin and stuff. And that can actually help with some of those symptoms, but as we're going to start to discuss in a little bit, if we know somebody potentially has a B9 or B12 deficiency, like maybe if they have problems with this 
methylation pathway. They have the MTHFR um, polymorphism, which we know many of us have. We'll get into that. Then um, this is going to bypass and allow for DNA and RNA synthesis, um, cell replication, good neural development, good cellular membrane health. So this will bypass those people that might be B9 and B12 deficient. Um, so much that it's shown in some of the literature, choline and betaine can help decrease neural tube defects with people that have folate deficiencies. So, it, you know, we kind of think of folate, that's how you prevent neural tube defects. You can do it with choline too, or betaine supplementation. So oh. right, that was a lot of biochem. I'm going to pass it on. So <laughs> sorry. I, I was all excited. You're doing great. Um, <laughs> so uh, I put in a nice calming visual on the right-hand side because this is actually integrated one carbon metabolism. So there are many, many papers about one carbon metabolism. And we're gonna talk about this later with uh, Dr. Matt and Dr. Kanita. We're really gonna talk about, you wanna think of these little methyl groups, these CH3 groups, you wanna think of them as either like a ball or a hockey puck. We gotta pass these around. And we have to remember that when we're doing it, it's a thing that has to turn. So when we look at this, integrated one carbon metabolism pathway, we're going to spend a bunch of time here because of the Kim Kardashian uh, gene MTHFR, a little too much, but, you know, fame for maybe not really being as exciting as it might be. But uh, so we want to talk about that. So here's this whole thing about the homocysteine we started with, because that's the thing we're really trying to get rid of. But these wheels are very interrelated, and we're going to come back to them again. But what we really want to see, as we were talking about all the things you make with the methyl groups from SAMI, and we're going to do this, but this wheel is very much integrated with this, where we see uh, thymidine synthesis. This is DNA synthesis here. But take a look. Let's just go one wheel over here. We're going to see dopamine and serotonin. So really, your neurotransmitters with your mood are really very integrated in the way that when we have good turning, we're gonna impact that as well. And then when we look over here, here we see arginine and nitric oxide synthase. We're gonna have really good uh, endothelial health, cardiovascular health. And then again, we're seeing these other things here where we're going to get uh, those vasodilation there. And really also we're gonna be integrated in the liver with the urea cycle. So when we look at this all only by itself, it does not really let you see how integrated it is in all of these pathways. And one carbon metabolism is probably in the end, the reason for all chronic problems that it's just not working well. And so uh, Matt, Dr. Matt, we're up to you on how do we get rid of that homocysteine? Awesome. And, you know, I'm a very much a visual learner. So that last that last chart, you know, is all over in my head. So this is a much simpler one to, to go with here. So, um, so on the far left here, we've got the 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate that comes in. And so this is your hockey puck or ball, uh, so to speak. And it um, takes the methyl group and sends it over to the cobalamin. And well, comes together at the bottom and makes your methylcobalamin. So that's the form that's in the, the shake as well. And so... The goal is that the methylcobalamin helps with the methionine synthase, helps convert the homocysteine over back to methionine with its methyl donors. And so that's uh, the end product. We want the methionine. You know, I like to explain it sometimes when I'm talking to patients, you know, the homocysteine is the, the bad byproduct we don't want. We want the methionine. So it's kind of go, you know, good guys, bad guys and, and how it all works. And we'll kind of get into how it's much more complicated than it looks as this. Uh, but uh, this is a good way to kind of give you a, the base uh outline of how it goes. So on the next slide here, we kind of get into the actual MTHFR uh, gene mutation here where that nice purple X is. So we see the homocysteine, you know, kind of from the same chart on the, the last slide here. So we're going from homocysteine to methionine, but we need the uh, five methyl tetrahydrofolate uh, to be converted from 510 methylene tetrahydrofolate, um, but the MTHFR gene doesn't allow us to do that. So, and, you know, logic speaking, oh, if we just have, take a, you know, a methyl folate supplement that would solve our problems. And in theory, it, it, it sort of does. But if we, um, as we talk about uh, with Dr. Balliette, the actual, actually, if you go back to the last slide for a second, 
I kind of visualize it on here. If you just insert the methyl cobalamin into the ring here, it kind of gets rid of the need for the methyl uh, tetrahydrofolate. So it's kind of getting your, uh, you know, getting your ball in the game later on, so, you know, fourth quarter, two minute drill, you got the ball. <laughs> um, go back. Can you go to the next slide again for me? Thank, thanks. So, um, so as we, as uh, Dr. Callahan uh, stated earlier, uh, choline could also be another way that we can convert homocysteine to back to methionine, uh, betaine being one of the best sources for that. So there's multiple ways to work around this. And so someone who has the MTHFR uh, gene mutation, choline is going to be essential for that, as well as methyl cobalamin. Both are two different ways to get to the same uh, end product there. Um, and also B6 being another important methylator, um, helping convert uh, homocysteine back to cysteine. And so I, as I remember from Dr. Balliet teaching, you know, B6912 methylation or one, two, three energy and five, six, nine, 12 methylation. And I remember learning like, what's methylation? <laughs> and I'm still sitting here, what's methylation? But I know what it is much more now. <laughs> um, and then uh, moving on to the next slide here. And so this is where I like to bring it all together into more of like the, the clinical aspect of things. And so B12 has lots of, lots of, as you saw in that huge diagram a couple of slides ago, there's a lot of different things going on. And so uh, DNA synthesis being the first one with cell formation, blood formation, mucous membrane. So I think of someone uh, who's deficient in B12, what types of symptoms or what types of uh, 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 like issues or, or uh, diagnoses you may have from this. So you think of groups of people like anemias, uh, like oxidative stress, which, you know, from the cell formation DNA synthesis, you know, if you have proper DNA synthesis, then, you know, that helps avoid any types of cancer, precancerous lesions in the body as well. Energy metabolism. So I think of, uh, I think of my dad as an example. He, he, he's, he doesn't know science very well, but he's very good in tune with his body. He's like, whenever I feel fatigued, I just take my B12 gummy and I feel better. I'm like, oh, great, dad. Great. <laughs> and so energy metabolism with uh, energy production, uh, physical performance, vitality are all uh, huge impacts with B12. Um, the one that I think is uh, hugely crucial is lipid metabolism. So we talked about earlier, uh, cell membrane protection, the myelin sheath that goes across the nerve. It's kind of like a, uh, I think a copper wiring to help insulate the nerves so they conduct better, more efficiently. So I think of uh, patients who, who have this is to cause, or sorry, who would be deficient. Uh, they'd have things like neuropathies. So I think of patients like diabetics who have diabetic neuropathies and to kind of dip into another presentation, uh, drug-induced nutrient depletion, we talk about metformin, which is one of the main uh, drugs for di for diabetics. Uh, it It's well known to deplete B12. So it's like someone could have a diabetic neuropathy and deficient in B12. It's no wonder they have all these huge peripheral neuropathies. And then going to the fourth circle here, messenger substances. So we talk about hormones, neurotransmitters, mind cognition. So this is a group of people who you know, may suffer from anxiety or depression from the lack of all these neurotransmitters. So this is a huge, you know, huge group of people that, you know, are, you know, medicated. And, and so there's, you know, the lots of different uh, avenues that this could happen, but B12 could be one of them. And finally, uh, detoxification, talk about cyanide, homocysteine, uh, nitric oxide. So this is your group of people. Well, we, we talk about the most common B12 supplement is your uh, cyanocobalamin which is a cyanide group attached to the cobalamin instead of a methyl group. So now, um, you know, it seems counterintuitive to have a, a cyanide group, something that's, you know, harmful to our body to be attached to it. Um, and so uh, it's important to have a proper B12 so we can have a more effective and efficient way uh, of methylating through the body there. And this is also your group of people who, you know, this is where the homocysteine we talked about, cardiovascular disease and risk and all of that would definitely be increased in this, this group of people. So we really want to talk about that, about the importance of the B12 and having it in the right form. And unfortunately, the majority of supplements on the market either have it as cyanocobalamin, or they have both the folic acid and the, and the B12 both methylated. So we're going to talk about that problem later. Right now, we're just going to talk about what is the form of B12 that you actually need and what are all those ideas about B12. So when we talk about MTHFR, that doesn't allow you to make methylfolic acid. 40% of us have MTHFR. And so we don't actually 
make methylcobalamin from the MTHFR. So when you have MTHFR, you cannot make methyl tetrahydrofolate. So this is not going to be there, but you still need this methylcobalamin. It is the coenzyme, as Dr. Matt said, to go from homocysteine to methionine. If I put in cyanocobalamin, my liver is going to have to take the cyanide group off and we're going to have to methylate it some other way. And so that's why I'm not really a fan at all of that. And we'll see a slide in a minute why that's so bad. But what's interesting is if we put methylcobalamin in and we go homocysteine to methionine, then that cobalamin becomes cobalamin because the methyl group now has gone on to the homocysteine, changes its name to methionine, which is good for you. That cobalamin then can be in your liver made into a thing called adenosyl cobalamin. Adenosyl cobalamin is actually a really important form of cobalamin or B12 that does this interesting reaction that when I was in school was the only way you could tell if you were B12 deficient, if you had methylmalonyl CoA go up in your 24 hour urine and you had to do a 24 hour urine collection. But this is in the eighties, right? When we knew nothing and you could not do blood analysis for B12. But why do we need succinyl CoA? That's really interesting because that's this thing right here. Branched chain amino acids, fatty acids, and cholesterol all have to be converted in your mitochondria to methylmalonyl CoA, which is a B12 in adenosyl cobalamin form to become succinyl CoA, which is in the Krebs cycle, but is an incredibly important precursor to hemoglobin, myoglobin, and all the cytochromes for the cytochrome chain. So this is why energy metabolism is so B12 dependent and anemia is so B12 dependent and why you can't get folic acid without B12, because when you get folic acid without B12, you may do this step here, but you cannot do this step. So it's quite problematic to do that. Additionally, if you are one of the fans of the ketone diets where you're gonna be in ketosis because you're gonna be saying, oh, I wanna be keto, 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 you cannot actually burn uh, keto, ketone bodies without succinyl CoA. And if you do not have B12, you will not be able to do that. And so there's a lot of people who are keto and maybe also vegan. They have to be really cautious about what B12 they're taking in. If we look over here now at the methionine cycle that we've been talking about, what we're going to see is that 40% of us, the 40% of us who are actually MTHFR, Dr. Marie Cadilla, Cornell, and others have shown with Absolutely, that homocysteine is taking this middle arrow up. It's using the betaine that's been made from the choline to methylate, and that's what this enzyme, it is a B6-dependent enzyme, and B6 can be deficient, as Dr. Mao was talking about, drug-induced nutrient depletion. So if I'm on birth control pills or hormone replacement therapy, possibly ADD medication, then I can start to get pretty B6 deficient. So I'm gonna need that B6 with that choline at the same time, I wanna have them together so that now I can methylate and go this route here. Because again, we're not gonna be able to do this with the 40% of us who have MTHFR. So this B12 is either gonna to have to be methylated because we put it in methylated, or we're gonna use choline. We cannot do this step. Therefore, in this folic acid cycle, what we're gonna see preferentially, and this is what Dr. Kinney is gonna talk about in a second, we're gonna make DNA. When we look here on what are the problems with cyanocobalamin and why I'm like so against it more than ever, is this is a list from the Mayo Clinic. So literally I just put it on this slide, but I wanted to show you that I actually went to the website uh, for the Mayo Clinic showing you that cyanocobalamin, which if you have any gastritis, they give it to you nasally to bypass if you've lost intrinsic factor. So say you can't absorb it. So it's considered a drug when you put it in your nose, but it is also used when they give you a B12 shot. It is cyanocobalamin. But when you look at it, it does actually tell you what all the side effects are. And I just actually wrote them down. The reason it mattered to me so much that this was true when I get out of here and go back to the PowerPoint, um, which I have to remember how to do, right? So now I'm going to have uh, an issue with my uh, old PowerPoint. I guess I could close this, right? And go back to the PowerPoint. We'll just do this for a second. There you go. Here we are back. Um, it's that I had a patient a couple of months ago, and that's why I got really on this, 
where I could not get rid of his low back pain. And he had quite a bit of numbness down his leg, which looked like it was sciatica. But no matter what I did, four visits, no impact. On visit number four, I asked him, what are you doing differently? And he was Dr. Matt's dad. No, he wasn't really Dr. Matt's dad, but he said, I, my doctor told me to take B12. And he was taking like 2,000 times the RDA of B12 as cyanocobalamin, which is really common, actually. And I had him get off of it, switch, uh, and uh, in three weeks, totally gone. So, and nothing I did was making any difference. So I really... You really got to start talking to our patients and saying, if you are on the gummies, most things, and here's the bad news. I like oat milk a great deal. I had to start looking at all the oat milk because there are a majority of the oat milks on the market actually add cyanocobalamin. And uh, I learned just yesterday on a call with Brendan that Red Bull also has cyanocobalamin in it. So there's a lot of things, if they just say B12 on them, it is cyanocobalamin. And that's because it's much less expensive than asking for methylcobalamin. So if you're seeing these kinds of things and you're doing everything you think you should be doing and people are not getting better, it is very likely that they have cyanocobalamin in the supplement that they're taking. And just to add to that, almost all the energy drinks are cyanocobalamin. You look at Celsius, Monsters, they all have B12 for energy and it's cyanocobalamin. Yeah. So a little yep. scary right there, right? Mm -hmm. So Dr. Kenita. Yeah. Um, I think with this slide, Dr. B, you told us this is the one that got you mad because yes, <laughs> it got me really mad. <laughs> yeah. Um, it was about, you know, the difference with folic acid and folate. And this is just showing how the folic acid is, has the hydrogen ion. And then when it goes, I believe when it goes in the blood, it becomes folate. Is that correct, Dr. B? Yeah. At that pH. Yes, exactly. Yes. Cause the, the person in question did say that they didn't want to take the shake because I had folic acid instead of folate, which is very silly. So knowing this, um, that the folic acid is actually the one that we need to push into DNA synthesis, which we'll see in the next slide. So this is a lot of biochem and this slide totally freaked me out the first time <laughs> looking at it. But if we kind of go back very quickly to the... Um, the importance of the right forms of B12, Dr. B. This is just a zoom in of the folic acid cycle in that area right there. So we're just looking specifically in that uh in that metal in that cycle. So if we go back to the slide. So this is just so showing how you know we're first converting the dihydrofolic, uh, I'm sorry, the folic acid. And it uses NADPH to make it become dihydrofolic acid. Um, and from there, it uses another ND, NADPH oh, to make tetrahydrofolic tetra acid. A, sorry. Um, I'm listening to a <laughs> webinar right now. Dr. Dr. Beth, um, can, I think you need to mute yourself. Dr. Oh. Thanks. Go ahead, can you? Yeah, so it becomes tetrahydrofolic acid. And so this is a really actually important step here is we have the serine using B6 and the enzyme SHMT become glycine. And we need the B6 in this step to become the uh, N5, N10 methylene tetrahydrofolate. And from here, it also eventually goes into uh, to become the N5 methan methano THF. These are a mouthful, all these chemical terms. And then from there, it uses the water to become the N10 formal tetrahydrofolate. And this is actually the step where it goes into the purine synthesis, which is part of DNA. And the side note here with the NADPH is the active form of B3. So a lot of the NADPH that we see in these intermediate steps actually come from the pentose phosphate shunt or the pentose phosphate pathway. And in my research of, you know, trying to do a good job with this, 
the pentose phosphate shunt not only makes all the NADPH, um, the red blood cells also use this pathway, but it also helps with the purine and pyrimidine synthesis. So all these are really important in terms of when we're taking uh, the folic acids in the potential power nutrition, this is actually pushing it towards the cycle of making more DNA, RNA, um, along with the pentose phosphate shunt, which not only creates the intermediates of the NADPH, but also helps with purine and pyrimidine synthesis. So it's so all really important things right here. So next slide. Um, and this is just going back to uh, what we talked, like the theme of this, the MTHFR. So in this step, uh, Dr. Matt also talked about it in the beginning where it's the MTHFR is responsible for converting the uh, 510-methylene tetrahydrofolate to the 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate. And this is what um, is used to help convert homocysteine to methionine using, but you need also the uh, methylcobalamin in this step. So uh, what's the percentage that don't have this step, Dr. B? 40%. Or MTHFR. So 40% of us don't even do this. So this is why that um, the potential power nutrition has the methylated B12. So essentially you can skip this step to be able to convert homocysteine to methionine. Matt. All right. So another big fun chart. Um, so as we see, there's the MTHFR gene mutation here, which we kind of just talked about, helps convert it to the 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate. Um, and in this step, or in this chart, rather, I, we kind of like to, I like to go back to the analogy of, you know, uh, one hockey puck or one ball in the game with the, the methyl group here. And so Again, our goal here is to convert homocysteine to methionine. And as you see, there's a lot of arrows going from homocysteine towards methionine. So you've got the one going for the methyl B12, which we enter into the equation here. We've got the choline that can help methylate, uh, or, sorry, into the methionine there. And then obviously the uh, 5 methyl tetrahydrofolate as well. So I, I actually asked Dr. Belliet the other day or a week. I don't know what time my perception of time is all off. Uh, about uh, I I I'm I got at it. I had a uh, nutrition TikTok and someone was saying you have to take methyl tetrahydrofolate and methylcobalamin. And so I went to Dr. Balliet and ran as fast as I could and said, well, "Does this make sense biochemically?" <laughs> and as she said, "No," and and I, she was explaining it to me and she said, "You can only have one hockey puck in the game at a time." And so I was going with the analogy there, and I kind of came to the to this a similar analogy where I think about you're going on a, a a ride at a theme park here, and the 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 ride is homocysteine to methionine. It's a very short ride, but in order to get on that ride, you have to stand in line. And so if you stand in line, you can either go through the methyl B12 way, or you can go through the choline way. Those are the two ways. But if you have a methyl tetrahydrofolate and a methyl B12, which is in the same rung, it's like two lines bottlenecking right here. So it's an inefficient way to convert homocysteine to methionine. The choline can still work, you know, all day. So it's kind of spinning. People are have the fast pass there, you know, and the fast pass can also go from the methyl B12. Um, but if you have the MTHFR gene, then that per that person is you can't get the uh, you they can't they they've got the the not the fast pass <laughs> they're going all the way around recycling the the folic or the folate in the far right cycle there, so the goal here is that we want to be as efficient as possible with anything that our, our methylation so B twelve and choline are going to be the best ways to do that and if you add the methyl tetrahydrofolate it's an inefficient way of, of uh, going through the process, but that's why the folic acid or, or folate and their more basic forms are going to be more efficient in helping run the whole process smoothly. Great. Back to Erica. Yeah, got it. So um, I'm just going to wrap up some of the key points and uh, then if uh, I'd love to hear any questions or thoughts that you guys have too. So Obviously, there was a lot of discussion about the passing of the hockey puck, the ball, the methylation, the one carbon metabolism. It's so much more complicated, right, than we ever imagined. And I would 
hazard a guess that in the next several years of nutritional research, we're just going to learn more and more, right? Um, stuff that I learned when I was in school is definitely different than what I'm utilizing now. Um, so, but we need to keep in mind that 40% of the people walking in our office potentially are going to have difficulty with methylation and the folate pathway. Um, so taking in that into account, we have to consider some of the fast passes that Dr. Mack talked about, maybe choline or betaine as an alternative kind of methylation, recycling that methionine, um, or maybe methyl, methyl B12, right? That seems to be the most um, makes sense pathway, right? For us to support choline and methyl B12 to get us to get that reactive intermediate homocysteine back to methionine. So when we intake folic acid, in essence, it's going to be converted to folate. And then um, and that includes us needing the pentose phosphate shunt, our NADPHs, P for power. <laughs> and preferentially, when we use folic acid and we have MTHFR polymorphism, we're only going to promote um, the latter half of that cycle that Matt was just talking about over on the right-hand side that's going to give us nucleotide synthesis, right? We kind of shut down the one, if we can't come in on the bottom with our 5-methyl uh, tetrahydrofolate because we don't have MTHFR, we're going to use folic acid from the top and we're going to really promote DNA and RNA synthesis. And that means healthy cell replication, healthy mitosis, right? All of our skin cells, our uh, endothelial cells, our epithelial cells in our gut, right? These are all dependent on a high turnover. So we need lots of DNA and RNA. Um, so it's more than just hair, skin, and nail health. It's every cell health. So lots to be said. And I hope we answered some questions for you guys today. Yeah. So I, I want to just say how grateful I am to the people who actually supported me in doing this presentation as I signed them all their jobs the other day. And what a great job that they did and how really blessed I feel to have them uh, as part of the team. And I'm gonna stop sharing so that um, if you're willing to be on the video, I'm gonna keep it uh, recording and uh, you don't have to have your face on it, but I'm gonna stop sharing so that people can ask questions because my guess is people have some questions and we're here to answer them. So does anybody have a, a question or is there something people would like to share? What did you learn that was new that maybe you didn't know about MTHFR? Is anyone who wanna weigh in? So, okay. Hi, Stacey. Dr. Mary. Hi. Yeah. So, from a, so from a nursing perspective, because I'm the only nurse in the group, right? Yeah. So, it the biochemistry piece is I'm still digesting it, but basically, if a patient or a person is tested for the MTHFR and they don't have it, then we need to make sure they're supplemented with a methylated B12, correct? And a choline. That's, or a and, choline. A, and, a, and a choline. Okay. Yeah, one or so I that's say some of each would be great, but definitely, okay. if definitely not because cyanocobalamin, but so methylcobalamin or the choline. And that's why okay. Lertron choline is so great. Right. So I think for in my world of health and wellness as a nurse, that's the piece that's missing is the choline piece. We're not taught about that piece. So that's been a big disconnect for me all these years. So I thank you everybody for clarifying that for me and trying to keep it in the simplest form. But I, I think if you guys are interacting with other people that are nurses, at all, that's the piece that's missing that nobody really is ever taught, that choline piece. Right, um, I know that, that uh, Dr. Alberti wants to say something too, but let me say the leading researcher in choline and folic acid metabolism is my colleague and friend, Marie Cadilla Cornell. So she is the person who, uh, she just recently retired and Stacia will love this, she's in Costa Rica. and. Oh. So she really is the one who realized that, especially for pregnant women 
and kids that if you are, and, and Dr. Erica Callahan can totally back me up on this. If you are folic acid deficient, but also if you're choline deficient, you may never make that back up because when you saw how it takes all that SAMI to make choline, if you don't have enough choline and that choline is necessary to make your brain and make your neurotransmitters. And so now you're going to use all that up. You're going to create homocysteine. You're going to get all that damage. You may never, ever get caught up in school ever again, if you are choline deficient. Okay. And likely due to this, in my opinion. Okay. That's great information. Thank you. Dr. Alberti. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, no, I learned a whole lot here. I mean, I'm definitely going to be rewatching the video because some of it, it was just a lot of info. But um, no, it was basically the same question that she had, essentially. It was just with the choline, like that's the main um, the take home almost. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of take homes. But for me, that was kind of just putting the pieces all together, essentially. So yeah, I'm really grateful for this uh, meetup. <laughs> Great. Susan, do you have something I see you're unmuted? No. Dr. Lisa has a hand up for a question. Oh, Dr. Lisa. Hi. Um, so I had, this is, you know, my brain has been dormant for a while having a child. So <laughs> it's waking back up. So I had um, genetic testing through Max Gen, and so I've been rudimentally aware of the MTHFR mutation, and I've been sensitive to it because my son has that C677T1, so I'm on top of all of his detox protocols. But on my testing, it says that I have three of the genetic markers for methylcobalamin sensitivity. So it sounds like there's something on the flip side to this to be aware of and to be sensitive to and to look out for and someone. And how would you know if you didn't have a genetic test, what would be some indications other than trialing and maybe not having the results that you're hoping for? I, I think that part of the, this is what, this is my opinion about this as I start to really pay a lot of attention to these testing where they're saying, maybe you have a sensitivity to methylcobalamin. I think when, they're seeing that and you're looking at that place where we looked, uh, maybe I should put that one slide back up here for a second, because I think when we see it on the slide, it may be really helpful to look at, um, at this one place here where we're looking at how it's all going together. Let me find where I really want to be here. Um, this one here. So I think what happens uh, when we're looking at that, and I was thinking about that, Lisa, the other day as well, as I'm reading myriads of papers, what we have here in the liver is when they're saying that you're going to have a methylcobalamin issue, I think it really has to do with where, how's that cobalamin coming into your body? So it turns out that you actually not just, so where if 40% of us have MTHFR, where has this methylcobalamin been coming from since we didn't have methyl tetrahydrofolate where we weren't making it, right? So methylcobalamin is made by the action of bacteria on animal products. So if you eat meat or you have animal products and there's bacteria in it, they're always gonna make methylcobalamin. And that methylcobalamin, when it gives its methyl group, is going to then just become cobalamin. It then has an enzyme that can take part of ATP and make succinyl-CoA. So I think when they're saying that you're sensitive to this, what would be interesting to me uh, to look more closely at that DNA result is it, do you have trouble with your mutase? Are you overloading that system? How much methylcobalamin have you put in? Because what's interesting is that methylcobalamin is in microgram amounts for 100%. That's a difficult thing, bizarrely, when they're making up vitamin formulas. They want to put more in because they don't want to have to actually measure it at that very low amount. So when you look at a lot of these products that have both, that decide that the way they're going to deal with MTHFR and the, and, and the noise 
is they're going to put a methyl folic acid and a methyl B12 in. I'm against that personally. I'm against it because then we got two hockey pucks in the in the game. As we say here, you know, we've got this hockey puck and we've got this hockey puck. Like they need this had to give its methyl group to cobalamin to make this. And then this gives its methyl group to homocysteine and then it becomes this. So we got to pass the ball, as Dr. Matt says, from here to this, becomes this, pass it to this, it becomes this. I methylate them both. I think we're going to overload the system. So I'm interested in this, Lisa. Is it because they're seeing sensitivity because they're methylating both of them? And then where are you? Because, you know, if this is methylated and this is methylated, where's what what's happening really? What's happening? Because this enzyme needs this. So I'm very interested in that. And what's the problem with that? Now, it turns out that good gut bacteria, bifidobacteria, will make actually activated folic acid for you and activated B12, as well as biotin and vitamin K. So the importance of the microbiome, which we didn't even, I didn't even put on this, is so critically important because intriguingly, folate, met, FOL, was for leaf. They did discover it way in the, like the 30s in spinach. And so I'm, I'm a big fan of having uh, spinach because now we're going to have folic acid in the folate form and actually in the leaves. And so I think that's going to be better for us. And this idea that we understood one little piece of biochem and that we're going to put this in and then we're going to methylate this, that just is two hockey pucks in the game. It's just, I, I just like Dr. Matt said, we're going to really back that whole thing up. And I think that could be why they're starting to see an issue, Lisa. So I think provided they're not both methylated and they're only at hundred uh, percent. And, you know, especially if you're not having animal products, I think you're going to be okay. And, and unfortunately I wish there was a way to figure that out better. Uh, I would look at blood work and look at the cell size and see how, if, whether or not they have any macrocytic anemia. Because I think it's going to show up functionally there rather than spend three hundred dollars for a functional medicine test. I think we could, with insurance, just look at their blood work and pick up the size of their cells and see how they're doing. I think that might work just as well as anything else, to tell you the truth. Because I've been thinking about this. I don't know. Does that answer your question, Dr. Lisa? Yes, for sure, and it makes a lot of sense. That could be the source of where that. Because I'm sure these the the studies behind the genes that they're presenting in these testing results are correlational. You know, oh, when I see this, this happens. And well, what was happening before that? And I'm sure that a lot of supplements commonly come in both forms, both methylated. And just thinking back, reading how many supplement labels in the past couple months, looking for the right one for at least my son, I feel like I have been seeing both of them in methylated forms exactly and that's actually that what, the sense exactly like because we were all looking at dr callahan and i especially were looking all this up and and that's really where we said like oh lord you know here we are either it's got cyanocobalamin in it and i got that issue or now i'm saying and now i've got everything methylated and clinically what's interesting is i was using a, a vitamin that had pyridoxal 5 phosphate, so it had the active form V6, it had methyl cobalamin and methyl folic acid because, hey, that's where I was too. That's where everybody was, right? And then what ended up happening, I had a patient with macrocytic anemia, diagnosed pernicious anemia, 10 years, could not get rid of it. Took him off of that, put him on the shake. Two months later, totally goes away. And that's when I realized and also then uh, Dr. Callahan, I've been doing a lot of work on, on children's nutrition and we, and, and I know Marie Cadill personally, and we're like, oh my Lord, you know, she didn't come out with that research until only a couple of years ago. So like this whole idea that choline is the bypasser, that choline is there, that help the importance of betaine, that's not that old. And so this is where, you know, we say what we said, you know, 
back in the day and we thought we were right and we treated it as if we were right. Well, if you don't, if you have MTHFR and you can't make methylfolate, well, we better put it in. Oh, we don't want to have cyanocobalamin, so we better put in methylcobalamin. But then what happens is some of the functional medicine people do not know biochem to the same level as the four of us that talk today actually do know biochem. And when we actually see how complicated it is, we're like, oh my goodness, this is now a problem. This is, they're getting caught on the line. There's two hockey pucks in the game. However you want to look at it, I think that the proof is going to be in the pudding when we're starting to see that people are doing so much better with their cell repair when you don't methylate them both because we're, and, and I know we were on a call and saying, this is why we're seeing, you know, the women, the pregnant women doing so well when they're on this, because now we're not methylating everything. And, and then when we have drug induced nutri nutrient depletion, we realize that we have to have everybody together we're going to have to have all those B vitamins, one, two, three energy plus B5 for the mitochondria because we see the mitochondria are critically important there, but we need six, nine, 12, the methylators and we need them all together, but we don't need them more than hundred percent because now we're really going to have a problem. I think that's in the end, the literature, which does evolve, you know, that's the issue, you know, and when we have I think the problem with the old model, and this is my personal opinion, I'm going to treat this with this and this with this and this with this and this with this is a very Western clinical model. And if it had worked, we would not be 37th in the world in our health outcomes because we spend more money on healthcare in this country than anywhere else. And we are 37th. So we can, that model, in my opinion, has outlived its usefulness where we really need to have a more integrative metabolism idea. We're going to do foundational nutrition. We're going to do your macronutrients. We're going to do your micronutrients, but only at hundred percent and encourage people to actually eat food so that there's probably things in food that we still don't know about that probably are really important that you really actually need to have. And then we haven't even talked about the microbiome and how critically important that is. And I, I sent the group, the paper on the microbiome and the, and the, and the fully B12, B6 piece in the, in the microbiome and why that probably is so critically, critically important. But I'm a reviewer for the journal of complementary and alternative medicine and one probiotic does not work for everyone. And so you really have to figure out what's going to work for you. And, you know, if you can do it as food, you know, you do it as yogurt, as you can do it as coconut yogurt, or now that I was at the health food store, just checking it out. There's coconut yogurt, there is almond yogurt, there's cashew yogurt. There's so many choices now um, so that you can see the one that you're going to actually feel better on. So I think, I think we have to, you know, I didn't, we didn't even talk about that, but I think when we're talking about one carbon metabolism, the, the bi microbiome is critical. I don't know, does anybody else want to weigh in on this as we're videotaping this last little bit? Yeah, so I have, it says, so if we have homocysteine and methionine covered by methyl B12, do we need methylfolic acid? The answer is no, we do not actually. It was this idea, oh, that'd be good. But uh, Dr. Matt, tell us about the lines again, because I love that analogy. Yeah, so uh, the the if you have the tetrahydrofolate, uh, it, it's, you know, it's both analogies work, but if you've got two lines bottlenecking, because there's the loop, the tetrahydrofolate and the methylcobalamin are both going through that circle. Of, uh, there was the four circles of all the different uh, processes going on. They're meeting at that same junction. So they can't, you know, only one could go at a time. So it becomes a bottleneck waiting on the, the homocysteine to uh, methionine line versus if you have just one. And, and if you have just the tetrahydrofolate and cobalamin, you know, that's okay in theory, but it's the most efficient to have the methylcobalamin and having choline in your diet because and folic acid or folate in general, that's the most efficient way of doing it. Because technically you could have methylfolate and like cobalamin, but 
most of the other forms of Kobalman, you know, like cyanocobalamin are, you know, not good in that case. I don't really, I'm not too familiar with any other um, sources other than cobalamin and methylcobalamin or cyanocobalamin. Right. And if you, you see too, on the one slide that we were talking about towards the end, it's actually the folic acid that comes in and gets, can get shunted over onto that right-hand side pathway. And that's the dump to the dump reaction. If you remember back to Dr. Uh, I use that Dr. B. This is a legendary, this is going to the next generation dump to the dump. And that's part of our DNA and RNA synthesis too. So we don't, we don't need to necessarily get to that methyl, methyl tetrahydrofolate. The folate enters in through a different pathway as folate, a different form. So yeah. Dump to the dump. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So so I have a, a question. Um, so from a product standpoint, not that I want to talk about a specific product, but what are the best supplements for patients out there? I know we probably have to try like one or two different things with some patients, but what is everybody recommending their patients to take? You know, is it a thorn product, which product is, is, well, is I actually am having complimentary a... to all of this. Yeah. I mean, that, that's why I made potential power actually. Cause right. I didn't find I... anything. No, seriously. That's, what's really uh, a, a problem. I looked at everything and if they're going to methylate the B12, they always methylate the folic acid, which, and I, I get why they're doing it from this idea. Right. But I think it's not effective. And mm -hmm. so that is a concern to me. I, I don't know that I, I wish I had a better answer than that, but I, I don't really have a better answer than that. Right. So aside, no, I know that that's part of the reason why you created the, the, the shake, but some patients need more than just the shake. So for instance, right. I'm going to use my own personal circumstance because I have multiple sclerosis. Right. So patients that have multiple sclerosis most of us were finding, and there's very little literature out there that we're all deficient. We all have this problem and all the patients do. And we need to have, when you look at the B12 and you take it in your blood, they're suggesting that we have over 1200 all the time, constantly to stay really? so that our neurons function. So I take your shake every day, which I absolutely love. And I, I, you know, have one patient on it only right now, but I still need a supplement to go along with that. So is it possible for you to get a, a methyl B12 that doesn't have the folic acid in it? Um, probably, but I, um, I do some research, um, you know, and maybe Bonnie even knows which one and she'll tell me which one. You know, what, but, that's a good idea. Maybe what I'll do is look that, look into that. There's uh, a couple, you, there's but a couple you may come B12s. A, Right. Yeah, but you want to make methyl B12s, Erica? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't research how, you know, I, I use Mary Ruth Organics. They have a methyl B12 uh -huh. spray that I'll use. Um, uh -huh. Jaro Formulas and Thorn also have a methyl B12. Because since I learned mm -hmm. this from Dr. Mary, I also like to up right. my 12 as well for thyroid health. Right. So I do a little bit more of that. So I, well, I like the spray. I like yeah, the and there's an. Wrist. I know that there's another another sublingual out there. I can't remember mm -hmm. which one that was, but I mean, and I know there's probably a couple others. Um, I'm I'm taking one now that's a less expensive, but I think it has the folate in it. Um, yeah, these ones are just twelve. So right. Yeah. And so, so was it Erica? So what? Thorn. Uh, yeah, Thorn and Jaro formulas J A R R O W and uh Mary right. Ruth organics, which actually okay. I use a lot for the kids, but they have a right. spray and I kind of like that as a little thing after I eat lunch. I'm like right for a little right. cherry spray. But, right. But other but other other, you know, other chiropractors and other physicians, internists, other nurse mm -hmm. practitioners may have the same question. So it's kind of good for us to collaborate no, for on this. a product piece I'm, too. Yeah. I'm totally for to, this. To supplement Thanks, for, yeah, to supplement your shake because they're going to ask about that, you know? And then um, there's other people that are doing other types of protocols too, you know, and sure. obviously, you know, I'll, so, okay. That's great to know. Thank you, everybody. No, Erica, thank you. No, that's really good because I was having trouble looking that up, but I really appreciate that. I think, it, yeah, that way then we can 
have only one at a time. I think that's a good idea. And just what you're saying, Stacy, so, so critically important when you're thinking about myelination, that is a B12, that is totally B12. And that's why you really just need that. So normally you shouldn't ever take folic acid without B12, but you can totally take B12 without folic acid. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, did anybody else have anything? Let me just double check the chat and make sure I didn't miss anything. Um, and yes. So I think I answered all the questions. Anybody have any other questions? I think I answered all the questions on the chat. Good. Look at this, only four minutes over. This is so exciting. <laughs> Amazing. Good. Um, anybody want to weigh in on anything else at all? Dr. Nick, I didn't say hello to you. Oh, and so, uh, Zach just, Dr. Zach just said, uh, what are we going to recommend for choline? I actually am a big fan of choline in food uh, first. And so uh, nuts are really good. A quarter cup of nuts a day for women and a half a cup for men. Uh, egg yolks, very good. Then you can do one or two egg yolks a day. Well, you can do the whole egg, of course. And uh, chocolate is high in choline, but anything that has less than in it is really good. And you can actually, if like me, you are allergic to uh, chicken eggs, you can actually get less than granules. And so there's companies that just make less than granules, but it's a lot of less than is in um, a lot of salad dressings as well. So uh, you just kind of look around for that. That would be really great. And then there are some le other less of thin supplements, but I have actually seen, you got to put them in the refrigerator once you open them, uh, but it's less of thin granules. You can just add it to your shake or add it to whatever you'd like. I don't know, does uh, Kennedy ever do less of thin or choline with your patients? Cause you do a lot of pregnant women. Susan, you use um, mostly food. I agree. Mostly <laughs> food, right? Yeah. What about you, Susan? You have a lot of pregnant women in your practice. Um, food as well. Yeah. I would go with food as much as you can for the choline. Because it's a, you need quite a bit. Dr. Nick, did you have anything uh, you wanted to add? Because you see a lot of pregnant women also. I'll say Nick is okay. Oh, he said no. He's great. Dr. Beth? You see tons of women. You want to have anything you want to add? I'm looking on the chat. She's like, no, she's good. <laughs> All right, good. All right. I'm very excited to see everyone. Uh, I may send out a Zoom link next week uh, for uh, doing a little something. Um, maybe Stacy. Let me know if Wednesday or Thursday next week might be great to talk about the goddess retreat. Maybe we'll do it. Sure. If yep. people are interested in that, would people be interested in that? We'll let people send it out. Yeah. And let people know. It's really nice to be in the group and uh, and be just discussing things. All right. Are we good? Yep. Thank, Thank you. you so much, everybody. Thank you again, Thank you. Dr. Tina, Thank Dr. You, Matt, Dr. Erica. You're welcome. Thank you, guys. Um, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Have a good night. I'll stop the the recording, right?